Every generation has its hallmarks, but there are some things that were once everyday life for many that now seem like relics to the younger crowd. Today, we're journeying back to explore those unmistakable items and experiences that were second nature to us, but will draw blank stares from the kids of today. From the whir of a VHS tape rewinding to the anticipation of getting film developed, join us as we uncover things from the past kids today will never understand. 1960s, we had this quirky thing called party lines for our telephones. It was like a communal chat room, but for your phone. Imagine sharing a line with your neighbors and oops, you might catch a snippet of their juicy gossip while picking up your calls. It was like accidentally stumbling into the neighborhood's drama hub. Picture this. You're trying to have a secret chat with your BFF, and suddenly Mrs. Johnson from next door is chiming in about her cat's latest adventures. It was a blend of unintentional eavesdropping and unexpected camaraderie. These party lines were like an unplanned community connection, a prehistoric version of today's group chats. Two, three, six. Kids these days, with their smartphones and private conversations, will never quite grasp the innocent chaos and charm of those shared telephone lines. It was a time when every call was an unpredictable adventure into the lives of those around you. And number two is collecting green stamps. In the 60s, there was this interesting hobby called collecting green stamps. It wasn't about postage stamps with pictures of famous people or places, but rather the special stamps you could get while shopping. The idea was pretty unique, especially considering how we're all into digital rewards these days. Here's how it worked. When people went shopping, certain stores would give them these green stamps as a bonus for making a purchase. These weren't just any stamps. They were like currency. You'd collect these stamps and then trade them in for all sorts of goodies. It was a bit like saving up points in today's digital rewards programs, but with tangible stamps, you could hold them in your hands. People would keep these stamps in booklets, carefully arranging and counting them until they had enough to exchange for household items, appliances, or even furniture. It was a quirky and tangible way to turn your shopping into a little adventure, all while getting something extra in return. Green stamps filled wallets in the 60s, transforming shopping into a tangible adventure. But what about the simple yet thrilling joy of mastering a pogo stick in the same era? Let's find out. Do you ever notice how history has a way of repeating itself, even in the world of fashion? It's like a deja vu of styles from our parents' golden years, and one trend making a strong comeback is flare pants. These pants, also known as bell-bottoms, have a fascinating origin story. In the early 19th century, sailors in the U.S. Navy sported flared pants because they lacked a set uniform. The British Royal Navy later adopted this style due to its practicality for sailors working on boats. Fast forward to the 60s and 70s when the hippie movement embraced bell bottoms, often found as surplus Navy gear in thrift stores. The disco era brought its own twists with variations like loon pants and elephant bells. Nowadays, flare pants have taken on various forms, from leggings to trousers. They effortlessly pair with platform sneakers, making a stylish comeback. Screaming Will's Roller Rink, All Night Ramble 375. Here's a reminder about Wednesday from 9 until 3 a.m. Ladies free the first hour. Pet rock became a huge trend in the United States in 1975. Gary Dahl, an advertising man from California, came up with the idea during a dinner with friends. His concept was to have a pet that needed no care or feeding. Dahl wrote a pet rock training manual and decided to sell actual pet rocks. He bought inexpensive stones, packaged them in gift boxes with the manual, and sold them for $2 each. The rocks were a hit, and Dahl received numerous orders. By Christmas, he had sold over a million rocks, making him a millionaire. However, the craze quickly faded, and imitators flooded the market. Dahl, having made enough money, gave away unsold rocks to charity. He later focused on a new career, giving motivational speeches and writing books on making money quickly. Pet Rock returned in 2012, but hasn't sold as much as it did in the 70s. Back then, a basic rock became one of the best-selling funny gifts ever. The 70s were pretty cool. Sure, Sir Isaac Newton unraveled the mysteries of gravity, but could he have unraveled the mysteries of Rubik's Cube? This Rubik's Cube is a small square, measuring two and one-quarter inches on each side. 
It has rows of squares that can be moved and come in different colors. Red, white, yellow, green, blue, or orange. Each side of the cube has nine squares, and the goal is to make all the squares on each side the same color. As for its history, this particular Rubik's Cube belonged to Harry S. Warren, who lived in Wilmington and worked at the Cape Fear Museum for many years. The Rubik's Cube became very popular. It was invented by a person named Rubik in Hungary in 1974 and has been puzzling people for over 35 years. It hit the Western market in 1980 and quickly became a sensation, with over 350 million cubes sold worldwide. Can age of arcade video games? Stick around as we are going to explore. It was a cool time in the late 1970s to early 1980s when arcade games were booming. Space Invaders in 1978 kicked off a frenzy of shoot 'em up games like Galaxian and the space-themed Asteroids in 1979. Thanks to new tech, arcade games went from black and white to colorful adventures like Frogger and Centipede. Arcades became a big deal in pop culture, offering new and exciting games. Have you ever played Defender or Galaga? Or how about chasing mazes in Pac-Man? Driving and racing got a 3D twist with games like Turbo and Pole Position. And who could forget the start of platform games with Donkey Kong? Characters like Pac-Man and Mario became stars, even appearing in songs, cartoons, and movies like Tron in 1982. But in 1983, things took a nosedive. Too many copies of popular games, home video consoles, and worries about kids' influences led to a decline. The 1990s saw a comeback, though. They serve the practical purpose of keeping your lower legs toasty in chilly weather. Whether you're cycling, playing soccer, hiking, ice skating, or dancing, leg warmers are your go-to companions. Originally made from sheep wool, modern ones can be cotton, synthetic fibers, or even chenille. Ballet dancers use them to keep their leg muscles warm and prevent cramps, but there's no solid proof yet if they really prevent injuries. Back in the 1980s, leg warmers became a trendy fashion, especially for teenagers influenced by movies like Fame and Flashdance. Nowadays, they've made a comeback, not just for fashionistas, but also for practical parents keeping their little ones warm and making diaper changes a breeze. Mixtapes, those nostalgic compilations of music on cassette tapes, hold a special place in the hearts of those who remember the era of cassettes. In the 1980s, people exchanged mixtapes to convey messages or set a mood. These tapes, made by compiling songs from various sources, were a blend of creativity and personal expression. Initially a popular trend among DJs, mixtapes became a way for artists to showcase their skills and for DJs to create demos for potential clients. They were also a backup plan for parties in case of equipment failure. However, the practice of creating mixtapes led to piracy issues in the 70s and 80s, prompting changes in the music industry. Let's talk about the fabulous world of drive-in theaters. Now, these weren't your regular movie nights, no. Picture a giant outdoor cinema, stars twinkling overhead, and the best part, you're not squished into a cramped seat, you're chilling in the comfort of your car. One you'll find uppermost in the minds of most high school students, especially toward the end of any week. It was like a tailgate party meets blockbuster movie night. Families, friends, and even couples on a date would roll up, park their cars, and tune into the cinematic magic. Snuggling in blankets, popping popcorn, and maybe even sneaking in some homemade snacks. It was a whole experience. In today's era of streaming services and cushy home theaters, The notion of watching a movie under the open sky, surrounded by the hum of car engines and the scent of the night air, might seem like a vintage dream. But for those who cruised into drive-ins back in the day, it was the epitome of entertainment and a nostalgic chapter in the story of movie magic. Hey, 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 that supply of Ritz seems on the fritz. No, no! Imagine you're in school, learning your ABCs, but suddenly the teacher shouts, Duck and cover! No, it's not some quirky dance move, it's a drill prepping you for a potential nuclear attack. These were the duck and cover days, my friend. The Cold War had everyone on edge, and schools were like mini boot camps for nuclear survival. When that alarm rang, you'd dive under your desk, cover your head, and brace for impact. It was a mix of hide-and-seek and safety lessons, all bundled into one nerve-wracking experience. 
Experts will estimate the probable path and speed of approaching fallout. Looking back, it sounds kind of absurd, right? But it was the real deal back then, a quirky routine born out of Cold War paranoia. With their fire drills and lockdown practices, today's kids can't fathom the unique blend of fear and absurdity that came with duck and cover drills. It's a vintage slice of history that makes you appreciate the peace of the present. Now it's really important to stay calm. Remember that help is coming. Let's take a trip to the era before computers ruled the writing world. The trusty typewriter, the unsung hero of document creation back in the day. Before the luxury of sleek laptops and high-speed printers, writers, reporters, and diligent office workers relied on these clunky, clickety-clack machines. The typewriter was our ticket to creating documents with a tangible, satisfying rhythm. In our office, we centered the date at the top of a letter. Each keystroke brought a satisfying thud and a crisp letter onto the paper. There was no backspace key to rescue us from typos. Instead, we engaged in a tango with correction ribbons and whiteout. It's a bit of a jump to the next one on view. It was a tactile dance of creativity and precision. Today, with sleek computers and silent printers, the typewriter's clunky charm is a relic of the past. But oh, the nostalgia for the days when writing was a tactile, audible experience. Kids today, with their digital marvels, might never fathom the simple joy of a typewriter's song. Back before the era of grocery store runs and cold aisles, we had the milkman. Imagine waking up to find your front porch graced with bottles of fresh milk like a dairy fairy visited overnight. In their trusty trucks, these milk heroes were the morning messengers of creamy goodness. There was no need to rush to the store. The milkman brought the dairy goodness right to your door. It was a charming routine. The clinking of glass bottles, the anticipation of the creamy liquid inside. Plus, the milkman knew your preferences, ensuring you got what you needed. It wasn't just a delivery, but a personalized service, a friendly exchange beyond the threshold. In today's world of impersonal grocery aisles, the quaint charm of milk delivery is but a distant memory. The younger generation might miss the joy of waking up to a doorstep surprise, a tradition where the milkman was not just a deliverer, but a part of the neighborhood fabric. And the dogs, too. Imagine a time when pocket-sized magic boxes allowed you to carry your favorite tunes and the latest news in your hand. We're talking about transistor radios. These nifty gadgets, smaller than a paperback book, revolutionized how we experienced music and stayed updated on the move. Back then, these portable wonders were your go-to companions for musical escapades and breaking news bulletins. It's like having a personal concert or a mini newsroom in your pocket. These radios weren't just about entertainment. They were a ticket to freedom, letting you untether from the confines of your home and groove to the beats wherever your adventures took you. Think of them as your trusty sidekick, your own portable DJ, allowing you to curate the soundtrack of your life while out and about. So next time you enjoy your favorite podcast on your sleek device, tip your hat to the humble beginnings of portable audio, the transistor radio. In the golden age of television, the majority of households boasted black and white televisions, marking a simpler era in entertainment history. In the mid 20th century, color TV was a luxury not everyone could afford. The transition to color broadcasts began in the 1960s, but before that, families gathered around grayscale screens for their favorite shows. These TVs featured cathode ray tubes that emitted monochromatic images, and the technology limited the visual spectrum to shades of black, white, and gray. Despite the lack of color, the excitement of witnessing iconic moments like the moon landing or tuning in for the latest sitcom was just as palpable. Families often gathered in the living room, adjusting antennas and fine-tuning rabbit ear antennas to capture the best reception. The black and white television era may seem quaint by today's standards, but it laid the foundation for the vibrant, high-definition viewing experiences we enjoy today. Beatles' iconic appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show in 1964 
marked a turning point in music history, captivating the nation. Picture this, Sunday evening, February 9th, families gathered around their black and white television sets in anticipation. As the Beatles stepped onto the stage, the ecstatic screams of fans echoed through living rooms across America. It wasn't just a performance, it was a cultural phenomenon. The Fab Four's mop-top haircuts and infectious energy instantly won the hearts of millions. Surprisingly, the show almost didn't happen. Ed Sullivan initially hesitated to feature the British sensation, but succumbed to the undeniable buzz surrounding the band. The broadcast drew a record-breaking 73 million viewers, forever altering the landscape of popular music. This moment didn't just launch the Beatles into superstardom, it ignited the British invasion, influencing a generation and reshaping the global music scene. The Ed Sullivan Show became a symbol of the band's unprecedented success and the birthplace of an enduring musical legacy. Number 19. Public Service Announcements During Cartoons In the 1960s in America, there were special messages called public service announcements shown during cartoons on TV. These were like short reminders with important messages for kids. One famous example was about preventing forest fires. It featured a character named Smokey Bear who said, only you can prevent forest fires. The goal was to teach children about taking care of the environment and being responsible. These messages were not just about selling things, but aimed to make kids think about being good citizens. The cartoons acted as a way to share important values and lessons with young viewers, encouraging them to be mindful of their actions and make positive choices. Number 4. Waiting for Favorite TV Shows Back in the 80s, waiting for a favorite TV show was a weekly ritual. There is no on-demand streaming, just a fixed time each week when your beloved show airs. Family and friends gathered around the television, eagerly anticipating the latest episodes. It was kind of like a shared adventure. There were no spoilers because everyone was on the same page watching together. No binge watching. Patience was the name of the game. Missing an episode meant relying on reruns or hoping a friend had it recorded on a VHS tape. The excitement peaked during season finales or cliffhangers. Discussions buzzed at school or work the next day creating a sense of community. Water cooler chats were filled with speculation and theories about what would happen. Number seven, watching VHS tapes. In the 80s, kids had a movie night ritual that might sound strange today. Instead of clicking buttons on a screen, they ventured to video rental stores like Blockbuster, where shelves were stacked with colorful VHS tapes. These tapes held the magic of movies. Kids browsed the aisles holding plastic cases with exciting pictures searching for the perfect Friday night adventure. After choosing a VHS tape, they'd head to the checkout counter, feeling the anticipation of the cinematic journey about to unfold. Once home, they'd slide the tape into a VCR and press play. But here's the catch. No skipping scenes or instant access. If you missed a part, tough luck. Sometimes you even had to rewind the tape before returning it to the store. The joy of watching movies on VHS was like unlocking a treasure chest. The whirring sounds of the VCR, the fuzzy lines on the screen, it all added to the experience. Number 9. Riding Bikes Freely Around the Neighborhood In the 1980s, kids owned the streets on their bikes. Friends gathered, hopped on their bikes, and zoomed around the neighborhood without grown-up eyes watching every move. No GPS, no helmets, just the wind in your hair and the sound of spinning spokes. Kids explored their turf, creating impromptu adventures with no specific destination in mind. It was like a pedal-powered quest for fun. Communication was simple. Yells and hand signals ruled the road. If a friend's house appeared, you'd drop in unannounced, creating an instant party. It was the era of spontaneous joy, where every ride turned into a mini es. Number 13, playing outside until dark. Back in the 80s, Kids would play outside from dawn till dusk. No screens, just wide open spaces and endless adventures. Imagine bikes whizzing down the street, the thud of a bouncing basketball, and the laughter of friends echoing throughout the neighborhood. 80s kids embraced the great outdoors, concocting imaginative games and building forts from whatever they could find. 
There were no virtual worlds, just the real ones waiting to be explored. From hide and seek to kickball, every corner of the community became a playground. The street lights turning on signaled the end of playtime, a universal cue to head home. Moms would call out from porches, and the collective hum of kids reluctantly trudging home filled the air. Dirty knees, grass-stained clothes, and big smiles were badges of a day well spent. Unlike today's digital distractions, 80s kids experienced the pure joy of unstructured play. The great outdoors was their canvas, and each day held the promise of a new adventure. As the day's adventures came to a close, kids didn't reach for screens, but embraced film cameras. Honey, what did the fireplace in the second house look like again? Why trust it to memory when you can trust it to Polaroid Instant Pictures? Number 15, playing in the woods or fields unsupervised. In the 1980s, kids had a blast playing in the woods or fields without grown-ups watching over them. No smartphones or tablets, just pure outdoor fun. Children today might be surprised to learn that we used to build forts from branches and leaves, creating secret hideouts. Imagine getting dirty, making mud pies, and catching frogs. That was the norm. We explored nature, climbed trees, and played games like tag, hide and seek, or capture the flag until sunset. Back then, there were no GPS trackers, but our parents trusted us to be safe. We relied on imagination, creating adventures without scheduled play dates, finding wildflowers, chasing butterflies, or collecting rocks were our pastimes. No video games or fancy toys, just the simple joy of being surrounded by nature. These unsupervised outdoor escapades built resilience, fostered creativity, and taught us about teamwork. Today, kids might miss out on the thrill of unscheduled exploration as many spend more time indoors. Number 15, manual typewriter ribbons. Back in the 1960s in America, people used manual typewriters, and they had these things called typewriter ribbons. These ribbons were like ink for the typewriter. They helped put letters on the paper. But the tricky part was that these ribbons didn't last forever. You had to change them when they ran out. Imagine it like putting a new cartridge in your printer today. Now changing these ribbons wasn't as simple as pressing a button. It could be messy. You had to be careful not to get ink on your fingers or clothes. It's so different from today's world, where we type on our clean computer keyboards. Back then, dealing with ribbons was just a part of using a typewriter. It's funny to think about how something as simple as changing ink ribbons was once a big deal before everything went digital. Number 13, carbon paper for copies. In the olden days, before photocopiers became a thing, people used a clever invention called carbon paper to make copies of their writings or typed documents. It was like magic paper. Here's how it worked. You'd have your original document and place a sheet of carbon paper underneath it usually sandwiched between another blank sheet. When you wrote or typed on the top sheet, the carbon paper transferred the ink or impressions to the blank sheet below, creating an instant copy. It was like making a secret twin for your paper. People used carbon papers in offices, at home, and pretty much anywhere they needed copies. Even though it wasn't as quick or as easy as using a photocopier, carbon paper got the job done when you needed a copy of something important. It was a simple but clever way to make sure important documents were safely duplicated. In the 1960s, offices used adding machines with paper rolls for calculations. These machines were like big, clunky calculators, but they didn't have any fancy sirens or the ability to save your work like computers do today. Instead, they had a paper roll where all the numbers and calculations would show up as you press the buttons. You'd have to keep track of your math on this long strip of paper, kind of like a never-ending receipt. If you made a mistake, there was no delete button. You had to start all over again. Kids today might find it hard to imagine doing math without a digital screen to help, but back then, these adding machines were the best tools available for number crunching in the office. Number 8. Film Strip Projectors in Schools Back in the 1960s, schools used film strip projectors as a nifty tool for teaching. These projectors were a bit like early movie projectors, but simpler. The film strip itself was a long, narrow strip of images, 
and the projector would display these images on a screen for students to see. Each frame on the film strip contained a picture related to the lesson, and sometimes there were captions or text to explain things. The teacher would manually advance the film strip frame by frame, explaining the content as they went along. It was a slower process compared to today's digital presentations, but back then it was cutting edge technology. These film strips covered a wide range of subjects, from history to science, and they were a common sight in classrooms. As the film strip projector clicks to a stop, unveiling the bygone era of classroom technology, our attention shifts. But what about the milkman's daily deliveries? What timeless traditions awaited in the quiet routines of suburban doorsteps? Number six, writing letters as a primary communication. Writing letters was a common and important way for people to communicate. Unlike today, where we can instantly send messages with a tap on our phones, people back then would sit down with pen and paper to express their thoughts and feelings. This practice was prevalent, especially among the youth of that era. It was not just a means of conveying information, it was a heartfelt and personal way to connect with friends and family. To write a letter, one needed stationery, envelopes, and postage stamps. People would carefully choose their words, and the process of writing, addressing, and sending a letter required time and effort. Waiting for a reply added an element of anticipation to the communication. Letters allow individuals to share experiences, express emotions, and maintain relationships over long distances. In the 1960s, the art of letter writing played a significant role in fostering connections and preserving memories, making it a cherished and meaningful practice in communication. Almost like playing two different tunes on the same violin at the same time. Number three, using a hose to wash the driveway. Back in the 1960s, cleaning driveways with water hoses was a common practice that many people followed without giving it a second thought. Back then, it was routine to grab a hose, turn on the water, and spray away the dirt and grime from the driveway. This method seemed like a simple and effective way to maintain a clean outdoor space. This process usually involved using a strong stream of water to wash away debris, leaves, and stains. It was a straightforward approach that many homeowners adopted without considering the environmental impact. However, as times have changed, so is our understanding of water conservation. The casual use of hoses to wash driveways is now often discouraged due to concerns about wasting water. In the present day, there is a greater awareness of the need to conserve water resources and alternative methods such as using brooms or electric pressure washers. They are encouraged to clean driveways more efficiently while minimizing water usage. The big stick is here. It's the hop rod, the world's first. Number one, the pogo stick as a popular toy. The pogo stick was all the rage as a popular toy captivating the imaginations of kids across the block in the 1960s. Unlike the high-tech toys of today, the pogo stick may seem simple, but it brought heaps of joy to children back then. The magic happened with a strong metal pole, a footrest, and a spring at the bottom. Kids would hop on, gripping the handles tightly, and then bounce up and down with glee. What made it exciting was the challenge of mastering the rhythm and balance required to keep bouncing without taking a tumble. It wasn't just a toy, it was a skill to be honed. Kids would spend hours outside, practicing their pogo stick moves and trying to outdo each other with higher jumps and fancier tricks. It was a cherished part of the childhood experience, reminding us that fun didn't always come with screens and buttons. The late night hours were a period when the airwaves took a break and your television screen transformed into a canvas of mesmerizing TV test patterns. These captivating designs weren't just random shapes, they were the unsung heroes of the broadcasting downtime. When the regular programming went on a break in the wee hours, these test patterns stepped into the limelight, dancing across your screen like electronic artwork. They weren't just a kaleidoscope of colors and lines. They were the silent performers during the television's intermission. Think of them as the night shift entertainers for your TV set ensuring the silence doesn't feel too silent. As you drifted into the realm of dreams, these test patterns held the fort, silently awaiting the return of the broadcasting day. They were the night owls of television, 
painting the canvas of your screen with their quiet charm until the first rays of morning light brought back the hustle and bustle of on-air action. Let's rewind the clock to a time before touchscreens and speed dial. Enter the legendary rotary phones. Back in the day, making a call wasn't just about tapping on a screen, it was a workout for your fingers. Imagine a phone with a circular dial featuring numbers from 0 to 9. You had to stick your finger into the corresponding numbers slot to make a call, give it a satisfying spin, and then release. It was like a mini ritual for every phone call. Sure, it might sound a tad slow in today's instant gratification world, but there was an art to it. You needed patience and precision, especially if you were dialing a number with lots of nines or zeros. And let's not forget the suspense as the dial slowly returned to its starting position. For today's generation, used to tapping and swiping, the rotary phone experience might seem like ancient technology. But for those who mastered the art of the spin, it was a tactile and oddly satisfying journey through the world of communication. Let's take a stroll down memory lane to the era of film cameras, where capturing memories wasn't as instant as a click and a swipe. Imagine this, a camera that uses actual rolls of film. No, not memory cards or cloud storage, but physical rolls of light-sensitive material that had to be delicately loaded into your camera. Each roll had a finite number of shots, so every click counted. Here's the kicker. You couldn't instantly preview your masterpiece. You had to finish the entire roll patiently, rewind it, and then send it off for development. It was like sending your artistic secrets to a photo wizard who would magically unveil your memories. The anticipation of waiting for those prints to come back was both agonizing and thrilling. Today, with digital cameras and smartphones, the idea of waiting for photos feels like a relic. But for those who once wielded film cameras, each shot was a thoughtful commitment, and the joy of finally holding developed prints was a special kind of magic. In the pre-digital age, when the internet was just a distant dream, encyclopedias were the unsung heroes of research and homework. Imagine you have a school project and Google is just a twinkle in the future. So, where do you turn? The magnificent set of encyclopedias on your bookshelf. These weren't just ordinary books, but treasure troves of knowledge arranged alphabetically like a literary roadmap. Need info on dinosaurs? Flip to the D volume. Are you curious about ancient civilizations? A had you covered. Each entry was a carefully curated snippet of wisdom, and the glossy pages held the allure of discovery. Research meant flipping through these weighty tomes armed with highlighters and sticky notes. The encyclopedia was your trusty guide, and if you were feeling fancy, maybe you'd even use the magnifying glass attached to the bookshelf for a closer look. Today's kids might marvel at the idea of seeking information without the internet. Still, for those who navigated the world of encyclopedias, it was a tactile, organized adventure into the realms of knowledge. Travel back with us to a time when music wasn't just a click away, it was a tactile experience. Before the days of cassettes and CDs, the record player reigned supreme as the maestro of home entertainment. Picture this, a vinyl disc gently placed on a turntable, the needle making contact, and the room filling with the warm crackle of anticipation. Listening to music wasn't just hitting play, it was a ritual. You'd delicately handle the record, perhaps blowing away imaginary dust for good luck, and then carefully position the needle. That initial pop and hiss signaled the start of an auditory journey. Album covers were more than just art. They were gateways to musical worlds. Each record told a story, and flipping it to the other side was like turning a chapter. There was something magical about the analog dance of needle on vinyl, a connection to the music that went beyond the digital ease of today. For those who grew up with record players, it wasn't just about hearing music. It was about experiencing it physically and emotionally, in a way that made every note a cherished moment. Back in the day when you pulled into a filling station, it wasn't just about pumping gas, it was a full-service experience. You roll up and a friendly attendant springs into action. They'd pump your gas, check your oil levels, and even give your windshield a sparkling clean. 
But hold on tight, because in 1964, a game changer named Herb Timms stepped onto the scene. He cooked up a genius system that let attendants inside the store remotely activate the pumps outside. This invention turned the gas station game upside down, merging the convenience and gas industries into a dynamic duo. Now businesses could sell gasoline without the hefty cost of labor. The era of self-serve gas stations was born. No more personal attendance, but the trade-off was quick DIY fueling. So the next time you zip into a self-serve station, tip your hat to Herb Timms the unsung hero who transformed the way we fuel up, blending convenience with a dash of technological wizardry. Often many will grow old, have patience for the do. Hallelujah. The good old days when soda fountains were the coolest spots in town. These joints weren't just places to grab a fizzy drink, they were social hubs, especially for the teenage crowd. Imagine a place where the soda jerker, that's what they called the person behind the counter, worked their magic, whipping up soda concoctions that could make your taste buds dance. Soda fountains weren't just about the drinks, they were a vibe. Teenagers would gather around, sipping sodas, sharing milkshakes, and indulging in light meals. It was the go-to spot for a date, a hangout with friends, or a sweet escape from daily life. Think of it like a retro version of today's trendy cafes, but with a sprinkle of soda fountain nostalgia. The clinking of glasses, the hum of conversations, and the whir of the milkshake machine. Soda fountains weren't just places to grab a drink. They were the heartbeat of a community social scene where memories were made one fizzy sip at a time. Travel back to the groovy 1960s, when fashion wasn't just a statement, but a wild, bold rebellion against the status quo. Go-go boots and miniskirts, the dynamic duo that shook up the streets and danced their way into the hearts of the era weren't just pieces of clothing. They were symbols of a cultural revolution. Now, imagine being a fly on the wall of that swinging decade. Go-go boots, those knee-high wonders, weren't just footwear. They were a manifesto of confidence, a kick in the face of conventionality. Paired with miniskirts, these fashion powerhouses defied the norms, boldly shouting, we won't be hemmed in. For the kids of today, it's like looking at relics from a distant planet. The energy, the audacity, the sheer exhilaration of those fashion choices. It's something words struggle to capture. Those go-go boots and miniskirts, they were the pulse of an era beating to the rhythm of change. Step back to the enchanting era of penny candy, where local stores were treasure troves of sweet delights for every child. In those days, colorful confections adorned the shelves, each priced at a mere penny. These weren't just treats. They were tiny bundles of joy within the reach of every eager youngster. Envision the excitement as children meticulously counted their pennies, eyes gleaming with the prospect of selecting their favorite sweets. It wasn't merely about candy. It was a cherished ritual, a passage into the realm of sugary indulgence. The delightful rustle of paper bags filled with goodies echoed the joy resonating through those unassuming stores. For today's generation, with their intricate confections and elaborate packaging, the simplicity of penny candy may seem like a distant fairy tale. Yet for those who reveled in its sweetness, those were the enchanting moments that defined childhood, a world where a penny could procure a pocketful of happiness. Imagine cruising down the open road in a classic car, feeling the wind tousling your hair and the sun warming your face. How? by embracing the good old-fashioned charm of manual car windows. Picture this. You reach out, grab a trusty crank handle, and with a satisfying twist, the window obediently glides down. It's like a little mechanical dance between you and your car, a timeless ritual that connects you to a past era of simple driving. No fancy buttons or electronic gadgets here, just the pure hands-on joy of rolling down your window with your own two hands. It's a symphony of clicks and whirs, a hands-on experience that makes you feel like the captain of your vehicular destiny. Forget about power windows and embrace the rustic allure of the crank handle where every turn is a small victory in the art of driving. So next time you hop into a car with manual windows, relish the analog magic and savor the simple pleasures of the road. That's some value. Swanson can change your ideas about today's high food prices. TV dinners, those handy pre-packaged frozen meals you pop into the oven, became a culinary sensation in the 1950s. 
Back then, the idea of a complete meal neatly arranged in a compartmentalized tray was revolutionary. The mastermind behind this time-saving delight was Swanson, an American food company. Surprisingly, TV dinners were not initially created for couch potatoes glued to the television, but were inspired by an excess of Thanksgiving turkeys in 1953. Facing a surplus of 260 tons of turkey, the company devised a plan to package the leftovers with sides like cornbread stuffing and sweet potatoes. The concept took off like wildfire, transforming dining habits across the nation. As families gathered around their television sets, these meals offered a convenient and enjoyable dining experience. The popularity of TV dinners soared, reflecting the era's fascination with modern conveniences and changing family dynamics. So, next time you enjoy a quick, fuss-free meal from a foil tray, remember you're partaking in a culinary tradition born out of surplus creativity. The payphone has been an iconic part of urban landscapes since the mid-20th century. Imagine strolling down the street and stumbling upon a booth with a ringing phone just waiting for your spare change. These public telephones, scattered on street corners like communication outposts, were a lifeline before the era of smartphones. To make a call, you'd drop coins into the slot and dial the number of your friend, family, or perhaps a pizza joint for a quick delivery. The distinctive metallic clang of coins hitting the coin box became a familiar sound on bustling streets. Interestingly, payphones were not only for emergency calls or quick catch-ups, they were often a vital link for travelers trying to reach their destination. Maps, change, and the nearest payphone, essentials for navigating an unfamiliar city back in the day. While the payphone has largely faded into nostalgia with the rise of mobile phones, its presence on street corners served as a tangible connection point in the pre-digital age, adding a touch of analog charm to the urban experience. The company has bought all commercial time on the first half hour of all the network talk shows tonight. Number 20. Cigarette Advertising on TV and Radio For over two decades, cigarette commercials were a common sight on American TV until their prohibition in the 1970s. During this time, tobacco companies invested significant amounts of money in creating and broadcasting sophisticated ads aiming to convince viewers that smoking was enjoyable, classy, and harmless. As awareness about the severe health risk of smoking grew, tobacco companies responded with misleading advertisements and confusing claims. Facing a decline in cigarette sales, advertisers fiercely competed to promote new filter brands. Despite this, TV commercials continued to avoid addressing health issues, leaving consumers uninformed about the true dangers of smoking. By the late 1960s, the established link between cigarettes and diseases prompted Congress to take the extraordinary step of banning cigarette commercials from the airwaves, effective in early 1971. In the present day, smoking is prohibited in most places, leading to a decline in smoking-related illnesses such as heart disease and lung cancer. As cigarette commercials vanished from TV in the 1970s, leaving a void in advertising, what messages filled the gap? particularly during children's programming. I'm worried. I've heard reports that thousands of persons will be killed or injured on your highways this Christmas. Number 18, Sunday Drives as Family Entertainment. During the 1960s, gas prices were low, making it affordable for many families to own cars that were mass-produced on assembly lines. This accessibility to automobiles led to a surge in family road trips across the USA. The country was actively expanding its road infrastructure, creating miles of new highways. This era saw a rise in the popularity of the Sunday Drive, a leisurely outing where families explored the countryside or other picturesque areas. Families also embarked on longer journeys to state parks or the shore for their vacations. An additional favorite pastime was attending drive-in theaters, where families could enjoy a cost-effective evening watching movies from the comfort of their cars. The combination of affordable gas, widespread access to cars, and the growing road network made family road trips and outings an integral part of American culture in the 1960s. Number 14, using maps and printed directions for navigation. In the days before everyone had Google Maps and other fancy digital maps, folks in the USA had to get creative to find their way around. 
Back in the 1960s and beyond, when technology was less high-tech, people relied on a bunch of methods to figure out where they were going. They'd unfold big paper maps, jot down directions from services like MapQuest, ask friendly locals for help, keep an eye out for physical landmarks, and pay attention to road signs. Some even had these special gadgets called GPS devices just for navigating. People were also pretty skilled at reading maps the old-fashioned way, using their knack for understanding and following maps to make sure they got where they wanted to go. Those were the days before everything was just a tap away on a screen. As people in the 1960s unfolded big paper maps and relied on creative navigation methods, they had another trick up their sleeves. Carbon paper. Number 12. TV shows signing off at night. Back in the 1960s, when kids today weren't even a twinkle in their parents' eyes, something special happened on TV that they might never understand. At the end of a long day of shows, television stations would sign off for the night. That meant no more programs until the next day. Can you imagine that? Instead of endless streaming and shows all day and night, TV stations would play the national anthem or show a test pattern to let everyone know it was time to say goodnight. It was like a cozy little ritual to wind down the day. But nowadays, with 24-7 programming and endless streaming options, the idea of TV channels signing off at night seems like something from a whole different world. You're looking at the world's most popular soft drink with the new aluminium pull-open top. Number 9. Pull Tab Soda Cans In the early 1960s, soda cans had a different kind of top called pull tabs. These tabs were easy to open, but they caused a big littering problem. The whole tab would come off the can, and people just dropped it on the ground. This made a lot of mess everywhere. People would toss these pull tabs on the streets, in parks, and even on beaches. It became a big issue because these tabs didn't stay connected to the can like today's pop tops do. Eventually, people started to realize how bad this was for the environment, and they came up with a new design for soda cans. This new design kept the tabs attached to the cans, which helped cut down on littering. So now, when you open up a soda can, you can thank those who thought of a better way to keep our planet clean. Never before have so many children and youth crowded into our classrooms. Number 7. The Milkman's Daily Delivery One common sight in neighborhoods across the country was the milkman making daily deliveries. This service involved bringing fresh milk right to people's doorsteps in sturdy glass bottles. The milkman's routine was like clockwork, ensuring families woke up to find their milk waiting for them. The bottles were often left in a designated spot, like a milk box, to keep them chilled until residents retrieved them. This daily tradition provided households with a convenient and reliable source of fresh dairy, eliminating the need for regular trips to the store. Families could count on the milkman for their daily supply of milk, and the glass bottles were not only eco-friendly, but also reusable. While this charming service has mostly disappeared in the modern era, memories of the milkman's daily deliveries remain a nostalgic reminder of a simpler time when a wholesome staple was delivered right to your doorstep. Number 5. Playing Records at Different Speeds Back in the 1960s, playing records was a whole different ball game. You see, record players had this cool feature where you could change the speed to match the kind of record you wanted to play. Records came in three speeds, 33, 45, and 78 revolutions per minute. Each speed was like a secret code, telling the record player how fast to spin the record. The 33 RPM was for regular albums, the 45 RPM was for singles with hit songs, and the 78 RPM was for those really old school records. To make sure the music sounded just right, you had to pick the right speed. It was like a DJ secret trick. So, if you wanted to groove to your favorite tunes, you'd spin that record at just the right speed, and voila, the music would fill the room in all its glory. As the record spun at just the right speed, filling the room with nostalgic tunes, we couldn't help but wonder about another relic of the 1960s, the soda fountains. No Popular culture. Have you ever been intrigued by those captivating and unconventional lamps that appear to challenge the laws of gravity? This accent light stands out as the most striking one in America. It brings glamour, interest, and excitement to any place. It keeps changing, pleasing your eyes, 
and it's like a hypnotic and fascinating show. In 1963, British entrepreneur Edward Craven Walker birthed the iconic lava lamp, a groovy creation with a captivating flow of colored wax in a liquid-filled glass vessel. As the lamp's bulb heats the wax mixture, it rises, cools, and gracefully descends in a hypnotic dance reminiscent of lava flows, hence the name. Initially associated with hippie and cannabis cultures, these lamps have evolved over the years. The magic lies in a unique formula involving mineral oil, paraffin wax, and carbon tetrachloride, now replaced due to toxicity concerns. This concoction's density dance, driven by heat, creates the mesmerizing lava lamp effect. Are you curious about how roller skating, initially a basic wooden contraption in the 18th century, has evolved into a widespread global phenomenon? Join us on a historical journey through the evolution of roller skating, from its humble beginnings to the modern trends that have made it a beloved pastime at Skate World Center. In the 18th century, roller skates began as a basic means of transportation with wooden wheels, which were challenging to maneuver compared to today's advanced designs. The 20th century saw roller skating gain popularity as a recreational activity, with the introduction of ball-bearing wheels revolutionizing the experience. The 1970s and 1980s brought roller disco and roller derby, each with unique charm. In recent years, roller skating has experienced a resurgence with innovative designs, diverse skate options, and a growing community. As we enter the 21st century, roller skating has become a thriving culture, connecting enthusiasts worldwide through social media. Ever thought about how those cumbersome eight-track tapes became a sensation in the 1960s? William Powell Lear, during the early 1960s, brought about a music revolution with the creation of the Lear Jet cartridge, leading to the widespread adoption of eight-track tapes. Originally, they were created for cars as an alternative to AM and later FM radio. The 1970s saw the peak of eight-track tape popularity displayed prominently in record stores alongside vinyl records. However, smaller cassette tapes gained momentum for their compact size in cars and homes. By 1982, major labels stopped selling eight-track tapes to stores, but they continued through record clubs until 1988, making 1980s tapes valuable to collectors. Fleetwood Mac's 1988 release was the last from a major label. Despite major labels abandoning them, smaller companies still produce eight-track tapes today. Cabbage Patch Kids were super popular dolls in the 1980s. They are cloth dolls with plastic heads made by Coleco Industries in 1982. Inspired by Xavier Roberts' Little People dolls, Roger L. Schlafer renamed them Cabbage Patch Kids when he got the rights in 1982. These dolls broke sales records for three years, becoming a top choice for kids in the 1980s and one of the longest-lasting doll brands in the U.S. Besides dolls, they sold kids' clothes, bedding, babywear, music albums, and board games. In the 80s, Cabbage Patch Kids made about $2 billion in sales. They started with artist Martha Nelson Thomas in the early 70s, but then a guy named Xavier Roberts took her idea and put his name on the dolls, and they became a huge hit. In 1983, the dolls were so popular that there were shortages causing chaos in toy stores. But have you ever come across the golden... Did you know that breakdancing, also called breaking, started in the South Bronx of New York City in the 1970s? Back then, people in this neighborhood were inspired by the music and dances of the time, like funk, soul, and disco. Breakdancing is closely linked to hip-hop culture and is one of the original four elements of hip-hop, alongside rapping, DJing, and graffiti art. It involves fancy footwork, acrobatic moves, and a lot of creativity. Quickly, it became famous in the United States and around the world. Over the years, breakdancing has changed and adapted, with different styles from various places making it diverse and interesting. The big news is that in 2024, it was declared that breakdancing would be part of the Olympic Games in Paris. Now, can you believe those cozy coverings for legs that look like long, thick socks without the feet? Well, let's dive into the next nostalgic memory. They're not just a fashion statement. Are mullets cool again? They just might be. Even though mullets might not be the first thing you think of when it comes to stylish hair, they have a surprisingly ancient history. Mullets were a popular choice for warriors in ancient times, 
like Native Americans, Romans, Vikings, and ancient Celts. It wasn't a fashion statement back then, it was a practical choice for war. Long hair at the back kept soldiers warm, while a short front prevented hair from getting in their faces during battles. In the 19th and 20th centuries, mullets got a bad reputation and were seen as a sign of low social class. But the rebellious spirit associated with mullets has endured. In the early 60s and 70s, they became a symbol of defiance. So, are mullets making a comeback? History says they've always had a knack for being unexpectedly cool. Number six, recording music from the radio. Kids in the 80s had a cool trick for capturing their favorite tunes from the radio. They used cassette tapes, like magic music boxes. When a rad song played on the radio, kids swiftly pressed the record and play buttons on their cassette players, creating a personal mixtape treasure. Unlike today's digital playlist, this was a hands-on affair. No clicks or swipes, just fingers on buttons. The struggle was real when DJs chattered over the beginning of the song. You had to time it just right. Sometimes, you'd catch a bit of the DJ's voice, adding a touch of realness to your homemade music collection. Kids crafted these mixtapes with love, creating musical time capsules. They'd share them with friends, sparking many parties or romantic gestures. It was like making a secret code of favorite melodies. Today, with streaming services and instant downloads, the art of crafting mixtapes from radio tunes might seem like an ancient tale, but for 80s kids, it was a sweet symphony of skill and joy. As the rhythmic sound of cassette wheels echoed through the streets, the 1980s gave rise to a distinctive blend of entertainment and individual expression through the use of a Walkman. What a total sound sensation. Get yourself wired for sound with the Telmac Walkabout Stereo Cassette Player. Just slip into the featherweight headphones, pop in your favorite cassette, and you'll not only hear the music, you'll feel it all over. Number eight, using a Walkman. Before tiny music boxes were in our pockets, kids rocked it out with a Walkman. It was like a magical musical buddy, a small cassette player that made tunes portable. People popped in their favorite cassette tapes, put on headphones, and strolled the streets in a personal concert. No Spotify, no Wi-Fi, just the rhythmic click-clack of cassette wheels. Kids had to flip tapes to hear both sides, making it a hands-on DJ adventure. Mixtapes were the stars, crafted with love and shared secrets. Walkman went everywhere, to school, on buses, and even while cruising on skateboards. It wasn't just a device, it was a fashion statement, strapped proudly to belts or peeking out of cool jean pockets. Today, with pocket-sized music libraries, the Walkman might seem like a museum piece, but for 80s kids, it was a groovy gateway to a world of personalized tunes, turning everyday moments into unforgettable soundtracks. Capade. Number 10, playing with physical toys more than digital devices. Kids had a blast with physical toys that didn't need screens. Action figures and dolls were like tiny friends, ready for adventures in the real world. You'd create epic battles between superheroes or invent stories with your dolls, using your imagination as the ultimate power. Board games were the go-to for family fun nights. There are no buttons to press, just rolling dice, moving pieces, and strategizing to conquer the game board. Monopoly, Scrabble, and Clue were like passports to a world of excitement with no batteries required. Unlike today's digital gaming, 80s kids had hands-on playtime. There were no pixels, just tangible toys and real-life connections. Kids would gather around, laughing and bonding over the thrill of board game victories or the drama of action figure escapades. Though digital devices now offer virtual play, there's a certain charm to the simplicity of those physical toys. 80s kids know the joy of creating their adventures and memories, one action figure battle or board game role at a time. As the 80s kids reveled in the tactile joy of action figures and board games, their hands-on playtime extended to another realm entirely, the world of typewriter. Number 14, using film cameras. Imagine a time when taking pictures was like a surprise party. In the 1980s, kids didn't have instant selfies. They used film cameras, like little magic boxes. When they snapped a photo, they couldn't peek at the screen right away. Instead, they would patiently wind the film and wait for the magical moment when it was time to reveal their snapshot. After capturing memories, 
They dropped off their film rolls at photo places like film fairies. The excitement bubbled up as they counted the days until the pictures were ready. It was like waiting for a present. There are no filters, no previews, just pure anticipation. When the developed photos arrived, it was a photo fiesta. Friends gathered to relive the moments frozen in time. Some shots turned out perfect, while others had unexpected quirks, making each photo a unique treasure.